Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Three, two, one, and we're back. And Julie Harris, we are standing here in um, a hotel in San Francisco, and Mm -hmm. we're looking out a window, and it is absolutely an amazing view that we have here in St. Regis in San Francisco, Mm -hmm. I have to say. All kinds of cool stuff to watch. It's You know what's extra special about being in this city is if you think about the history of San Francisco, and if you think about, (laughs) I mean, you know, all the things that have happened in this city over time, just... It's extraordinary. And to see like right there is this old church. I don't even know. Mm -hmm. It's obviously a Catholic church. And then there's this uh, building that I, it is, I should take a picture of this and put on Instagram. It has got to be one of the most beautiful old buildings I've ever seen with all the detail. Someone's obviously put gazillions of dollars into it. Julie, look at the, The look look at all the brick and all the detail. It's It's incredible. And I'm guessing it's, uh, I can only make out the sign on the side of it It says collection of grand estate homes. So it's got to be some sort of rehabbed condo building. But, man. but it looks historic, too. And next to that is a glass tower. Next to that is the church <laughs> you were just referencing. And then a little building, maybe a four or five story, that also looks historic. So quite the mixture of things going on and off in the background. I don't know if that's the Golden Gate. I can't tell the clouds on it, but there's uh, bridges everywhere, pretty much. So you know, that is a Golden there? Gate. I think sure. it is. Yeah. And off, well, way off in the distance, too, is the Golden Gate, but also at San Francisco. So tons and tons of fog. And it's really, it's just beautiful. It's a beautiful city. Um, and I have to say, uh, one of our favorite stops so far in the country, we're going to 22 states. If you are listening to this podcast for the first time ever, Julie and I and Zoe, our daughter, are, are driving around the country. And we started out in Dallas and we headed north and we you know, kind of turned to the left and started out the very tip of the United States. And then now we're driving down through California and we're driving down then to through actually after California the only we only have a few hard stops that we know we're going to be going to and other than that it's going to be circling back yeah circling back and we're visiting with a lot of friends and family members and coaching clients and podcast listeners and exp people and just people all the way across the country and you guys are following us and giving us travel tips on Instagram and if you want to follow us um, on Instagram and also su- uh, send us suggestions and where we should go they're some of the best places we've discovered have been from you guys giving us little travel tips, and we certainly appreciate that. But it's a, a, it's a Tim and Julie Harris on Instagram, and uh, that'd be great. And we are going to be going through L.A. I know there's a big swath of you in L.A. that want to do visit with us, and I'll tell you what we're going to do um, is we're just going to – we'll tell you guys because we don't know yet which hotel we're staying at or most likely hotels we're staying at, and then we'll just – plan ourselves down the lobby uh, every evening for a couple, you know, yeah, however. they'll be centralized. They'll yeah, be, be easy hotels. To right. Find. And then, and you guys can stop by and visit or not. And if not, well, we'll just enjoy our Chardonnay by ourselves. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's a, kind of fun at these uh, coastal cities. I've noticed this in both uh, Seattle and now San Francisco. You know, these are huge cities with all these big buildings and everything, but I've been watching these seagulls go around and visit people's balconies. Yeah, I, I, I think it might be like their normal routine. So that's kind of entertaining to watch. But cool. uh, I tell you what, something else is that 63 degrees after living in Puerto Rico for two years <laughs> feels like about 20 below. I know. It's especially so, it's, with the little wind. Well, you know, it's so, it's so funny. Our uh, oh physiologies have changed. I mean, we're from Ohio and we should be used to cold weather. Yeah. But when you're out there walking around San Francisco and it's like 65 with no sun, it, it, it does feel like we're some sort of polar vortex. Yes. Whereas the locals are walking around <laughs> t-shirts. I, I guess that's the way you immediately know someone's a tourist is just uh, judging how many, uh, you know, coats and overcoats they're wearing. Yeah. Um, but I, here's the, the other. There's lots of magical little things in um, in San Francisco that if you look past what you know is, you're designed to see, it's, it's so beautiful. Like I, I saw this morning out some windows, Julie, when we were in the gym. I saw people. Uh, the uh, neighbors were um, bees. There were bee people were oh, beekeeping. Yeah, I saw that. Did that you was see cool. that? Uh-huh. Yeah, it was really beautiful. It's just really it's like cool. rooftop beekeeping. Yeah, that's what it was. Rooftop beekeeping. And I, let me share with you guys another experience we had yesterday. Uh, we needed to pick up some socks and just some, you know, basic stuff. And so we went over to um, some retail shopping. And the retail shopping that we went to was this big mall. I don't remember. It, Westfield, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was, uh, there was a lot of people there. But by comparison to the other cities we've been through, 
it was empty. And we started talking with just different people that were working there. And we started talking to um, just people we'd meet. I mean, you know, when you, it's easy for us to start conversations with folks, you know, and generally speaking, people here are incredibly nice and friendly. And it was, I think the first time in our trip, and I don't want to speak for you because mm-hmm. we didn't talk about this, mm-hmm. but I actually have gotten a sense that people are uh, really shell shocked in a lot of ways mm-hmm. from the whole COVID crisis because the folks here in San Francisco have been on real first class, first yeah. grade lockdown, kind of like frankly we are experiencing in Puerto Rico. That's right. Yeah, and there were and and we we're talking to some of the storekeepers and just the different people, and they were thanking us, like really, really thankful. Now we experienced a little bit of this on one of our previous stops too in Napa. But they were really, really thankful for us to be, a be tourists and b stopping in their stores, um, and even in these you know big sort of national uh, chain stores like a Nordstrom's for example, they were the same way. They were just they recognized they didn't recognize us, um, so they assumed that we were out of town. They started with where are you from? Where are you visiting from? And when we chat them back up again, they would say, well, we're just so used to the locals being our only customers for the past yeah, year and a half. Interesting. Um, and I'll tell you something else we saw. Julie made a comment. Um, about the fact that we saw a lot of store closures and vacancies. And these were in places where you never in a million years would have guessed there'd be a store closure. Oh, like, for example, we saw um, Walgreens and we saw, uh, what was the other uh, drugstore we saw that was that, that vacancies? They're completely yeah. out of business, like, basically. Not just temporarily closed, but closed, closed. Right. Walgreens and what's the other one? CVS. CVS, yeah. Yeah, but mostly Walgreens. We saw two or three of them. And, uh, and then we saw a lot of what were high-end retailers and again, this is a, we're in the financial district in San Francisco, and we're surrounded by, I, we haven't even fired up the roller.com yet to know what the average price there, here is, but it can't be cheap. Um, but retailers out of business in, a, in a, an environment like this seems a little odd. And our minds you know, went to, well, COVID must have closed the businesses down. So Julie asked that question. You know, why are, we noticed there are a lot of businesses that were out of business because of COVID. And the, and the guy said, no, that isn't the reason. And this was a guy working in um, a jean store, yeah. right? And he was mm-hmm. probably in his mid thirties mm-hmm. and he was, he, he was, um, uh, he had a kids and he was telling us about how he, you know, he had recently yeah, moved his family out of the city. He was, he was very interested in talking with us and sharing his experiences from the past basic two years. And he said what would happen, and it was happening where he was working and happened in a lot of these places. Even he said their store were robbed. And he said what ha- what was happening was that the retailers, anybody that was street level, was ha- they were having people break their windows. And he said this was basically still happening. And, um, and a big mob of people would go through and then steal all the stuff, and then they would leave. And he said retailers put up with it uh, for maybe like six months to a year. And then he said many of the retailers, and it is obvious, just closed up shop. And I had not – I heard about that. But I didn't realize until us being here yeah. how rampant it was. And I had read an article about Walgreens uh, closed on the West Coast a significant number of their urban stores because they had tracked the cost of the, the thieving, essentially, versus the cost of security to make it stop. And they decided it was easier to close the stores. And for those of you who were thinking we're being political or not, so no, please. No, this is all factual. You know, so bite your tongue and curb your fingers and thinking that Julie and I are <laughs> – you know, some of you get really worked up when you think Julie and I are talking about anything other than real estate. Well, we are talking about real estate because we're talking about commercial yeah, real estate seriously. right now, right? And a lot but, of it. And again, we're not judging. We're just telling you what this guy's experience was. We're not even being political. We're telling you what this guy's experience was. So for those of you who are hypersensitive to that, just listen to what we're saying. And th- so here was this guy in the middle of San Francisco. He was he was masking. He was, you know, everyone's wearing masks here. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it's obvious and it, there's people on the streets wearing masks, but there's also, uh, not a lot of people on the streets and these retail stores had just basically gotten fed up and closed up and, and hadn't come back. And it was something that I hadn't seen. I had seen before, certainly mm-hmm. for, uh, economic reasons, but I never seen yeah. before because of the lack of the ability for the stores to prevent themselves from being robbed. Mm-hmm. Um, and There's pretty he, much everything on ground level at this particular mall. Do you remember the story he talked about? He said Chanel got robbed like three times. Yeah, and, and he said they tried to combat that. You know, just like us being fresh into the city, like I think we pulled in yesterday, my assumption was this was COVID-related, and he gave us a good education. You mean economically uh, related. Economically related, right? Okay. So, uh, but in, in fact, they had just decided to shutter it up. And, and he said social unrest. He said it had become organized. People yeah. would show up. They'd go to vans and, you know, they well, were in and out before the police could catch up to them. Well, let's give them all the facts. Well, what he said, right? So he said he would observe, and this happened on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. Well, whatever regular was in his mind, where a big mob of people were coming in 
and they were breaking in uh, windows, they were breaking in stores, they were stealing as much as they could, and he said he would watch them run back out, and they would put all the stuff that they stole into uh, a car or a van, as Julie just said, that was waiting, and the van would drive off, and they would just disperse. And this is what ha- was happening on a regular basis. And I'll, I'll tell you, I don't know if you noticed this. Hmm. How many police officers did you see yesterday when we were walking around? We saw lots of private security in stores, but how many police officers? Not, I saw one. I think one. Yeah. There was I think a, I saw a lady cop. A lady cop. That's right. Yep. You saw it too. But other than that, how many, as, no, we're, looking out, as we're looking out on the window, how many uh, police cars or any kind of uh, police do you see? No, it's surprisingly quiet. Isn't actually. that interesting? Yeah. So there it is. These Anecdotal. are just observations, guys. Observation. These, these are not political statements. These are just observations, you know. Go to a new town, you kind of take in the scene, see what your impressions are compared to what, you know, talking to locals. And sometimes you find out maybe your first impression isn't exactly what's going on. They're living it. So, you know, it's different. And I I think that the overriding theme here for everyone regarding all the things that are going on is to just have that sensitivity and and realize that, yeah, it was interesting, Tim. I've got something on the uh, Premier website in the mindset section. And it talks about uh, 10 ways to have a better conversation. And one of her points that I've always loved, this was from an a education thing that I put up. She said, you know, don't think that this time is just like last time. And don't think that your experience is just like my experience. Exactly. And she said, watch how people converse and that it is a conversational mistake to say, well, that's just like... Because it's not just like Mm-mm. their experience is not just like your experience, and to be more sensitive to that, and to work on having better conversations, asking better questions, and listening. Well, but that was kind of what I was trying to pass along w- with yeah. my stories: is that there the sense of fatigue here, and the sense yeah. of um, just sort of I don't wariness. know wariness wariness is is palatable, mm-hmm. at least to the people we came across. You could actually sense it. It was an undertone or an overtone. In virtually, in virtually all uh, conversations yes. or just all sort of, you know, any kind of exchange with anybody mm-hmm. that they were all sort of living under this. I mean, we are living a under a cloud, edge. but they were a bit on edge living on it, but they were burned out on it. That's yeah. what I got a sense of. They were really tired of it. And that's the reason I was telling you the storekeepers and the people we ran into, they were trying to pass along that, you know, that experience of just having enough. And I think all of us feel that way. And to Julie's point that she just made, I hope you, hopefully you guys were listening to what she just said. It is really a time for all of us to be very sensitive and um, very compassionate, just be nice. right? <laughs> just be compassionate yeah. because your, your perspective living in, you know, everyone, all of us live within basically a 25 mile radius. We all live in little bubbles, right? And it's kind of fascinating if you think about it. Uh, I'm watching out the window as some lady is about to do some yoga on a rooftop over there. You see oh, that yeah. right over there? Yeah. yeah so she probably lives in this building. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's, yep, that's what she's doing. Mm-hmm. And she she probably does that every day at the same time. And this she's got is a her, great view. Yeah, she does. And this is her this is her bubble. This is where she lives. She probably mm-hmm. goes to the same stores, knows the same people, sees the same things every day. And Julie and I live in uh, Puerto Rico and Dorado and the same experience. And you live in the same experience. And the only inputs we have, what it's like outside of our little bubble, is the media. But what happens if the media itself is not really a trustworthy gauge of really what you're supposed to be or what's really going on outside of your own little bubble? And that's the blessing that travel offers. And that's what I feel from this experience. It gives you perspective. It, well, it, you know what? I'll, I'll tell you what it does is it really helps me to understand a lot of the political rhetoric is garbanzo beans. Mm-hmm. It really is not a valid, uh, at least from our limited experience, it's not a valid um, I think portrayal of how real people, regardless of whether they're left or right, mm-hmm. we, how real people are dealing with this historic time. Yeah, I, I think by and large, you got to realize that people are dealing with their own, you call it the bubble, and I would say even maybe smaller, some of your Navy SEAL books call it that three foot yeah. uh, radius, right? And, and they're dealing with their own stuff. They're dealing with their own families. They're dealing with their job. They're dealing with their commute, whatever the case may be. So I think that we all need to have that layer of understanding put on top of everything that we do, certainly in your real estate transaction. So just to sort of reel this back into the real estate conversation. Well, when I've, after this experience and some of the other experiences I had, now when you and I are trying to, when, when we're coming across something that is trying to uh, grab our attention from a news headline um, mm-hmm. or whatever, this experience, all these experiences from visiting all these amazing people all over the country that we've been blessed to come across, uh, is going to definitely add a very thick filter to how I interpret whatever the media mm-hmm. is trying to uh, sell me. Sure. And, and that's that's my biggest takeaway. I was hoping, truthfully, mm-hmm. that I was going to discover this on this trip. Mm-hmm. I was hoping that there oh, wasn't going to hard. be this real sense of foreboding and de- uh, decis- de- divisiveness in the mm-hmm. country, despite what we've been told 
what we're going to experience, it doesn't exist. No, at least I, not I from think what people are tell. cautiously optimistic. They're just weary of it and the guy, like ready to do the next thing. You yeah, know? I would say that's true. So, but, so but hopefully, generally optimistic. hopefully you guys are appreciating this experience that we're having. Hopefully we're giving you a perspective that is helping you. Because again, when you go out into your world and you go out into your 25 foot, you know, 25 mile radius, and you're starting to have these conversations with prospective buyers and sellers, do everything in your power to avoid having conversations that are going to be anything other than compassionate. Whatever they say, even if you don't agree, um, just be compassionate that their life experiences and their filters are not the same as yours. And just understand the way that people deal with different stressful things. Um, again, to Julie's earlier point, depending on their life experiences could be completely different than yours. That's right. So just be compassionate for other people. And you will find ultimately when you're compassionate towards other people that you're going to attract more people to you because there's going to be more people that are going to appreciate the fact that you were kind of a safe place for them to have a conversation. Yeah. And that's going to put you in a position to actually be a service to more people, which ultimately is your highest and truest purpose on well, planet that's Earth. You know, and I, I, it's funny, I was having a little flashback to our real estate days. And, you know, I used to uh, do what a lot of agents and brokers do is you tend to absorb other people's stress when you totally. have some conflict and transactions aren't the easiest right now. You've got a lot of back and forth. You've got all these different things. And I used to always have to remind myself, you know what, just because that agent or buyer or seller was a little direct with me or snapped at me about something does not mean it was about me. Who knows what they went through earlier today, right? And I will never forget uh, one of our... Uh, most interesting transactions, if you remember Rich and Joan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, really big transaction. We were both sides of a million dollar plus new construction deal. And it had been, had a lot of working pieces and I had a fair amount of stress keeping it all together. And and Rich, who is, wasn't he an executive at Battelle, Battelle or something? Yeah. yeah. Um, he it, it was the walkthrough and he came, he's wearing his suit. I'm wearing, you know, my realtor outfit. He comes, he puts his arm around me. He's like six foot something and I'm not. And I'm like, oh boy, where is this going? And he goes, I just wanted to thank you for being the rock during this transaction. I really appreciate you keeping it together when we had so many things going on. Yeah. And that I, that stayed with me because there were so many times in real estate where it was just like, oh my gosh, what is up with this stress level? So you guys have to realize you don't really um, necessarily know how important you are because people don't tell you during the transaction but they will shake your hand and give you a hug when you're done. Well, so ultimately, that's the reason that realtors, skilled realtors, frankly, will mm -hmm. always be relevant. At, that's true. And, that's and the bottom line. That's right. And so when you're having those days, because we know that you do, you have those 3 a.m. real estate night sweats, and you have those knockdown, drag out negotiations, and you have those nasty voicemails and texts now and then, just realize that this is what you're getting paid for, is being the leader in your transactions and knowing what the next step is, even if people don't say please and thank you all the way through, they will appreciate you for getting the job done for them. And ultimately, a lot of those conversations that will be stress causers, if not deal killers, are preventable if you have been essentially A, experienced, but B, also been trained to know what comes next. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times the, the emotional upheaval, you'll know that, you know, sometimes after a buyer's been in contract for, you know, 48 or 72 hours, then they start experiencing a little bit of buyer's remorse. Mm -hmm. And so you can sort of, you'll know through, you can learn the hard way through experience. You can learn, frankly, a lot quicker through coaching and training than to anticipate what those people are going to be emotionally experiencing days, if not weeks before they experience it. So you can head it off of the past. And then at the end of the transaction, they haven't had to go through all those peaks and valleys of emotions uh, because you've known what was coming next. You anticipated what was coming next and you helped to save them from having uh, the stress that, you know, is pretty normal uh, in any kind of real estate transaction. And that's how you actually build this business that you've all dreamed of, because now you have that certain je ne sais quoi that other people can't even fathom having simply for the fact that you were able to save other people's stress. At the end of the day, that's what real estate agents are. They're stress relievers. They're problem solvers. Sure. And if you see yourself as that, if you see that as being your driving purpose, being of service to other people, everything else comes naturally and easily. So for example, if for uh, some of you will resist and here we're coming up, um, well, we're just through a change of the month, right? And the smart ones amongst you will have hunted some expireds. And actually, we're coming into FISBO season too. A lot of FISBOs who tried in the spring are giving up. So there's going to be a lot of for sale by owners that you could be attracting to you right now. Well, how many of you are actually absolutely repelled against the idea of calling a for sale by owner? I get it. Well, change, change your mindset. What if all a for sale by owner is, is somebody that needs your help? What if all a for sale by owner is, is somebody that you need to have maybe the words compassion for 
that they don't know somebody who's in the real estate business. They want help selling their property. They don't know what their essentially, uh, you know, what their challenges are because they've never done it before. And you, instead of thinking, oh my gosh, when you're thinking about picking up that phone or making that call, opposed to you thinking about and letting your head fill with all worst case scenarios, which is a normal fear reaction. What if you instead were to say, my job is to be of service to this person. I want to help this person. What if your dominant thought, your dominant emotion becomes, I want to help this person. I want to be of service to this person, not for the sake of lining my pockets, but for the sake of actually being of service and helping other people. And as a result of that, when I do enough of that, I'm going to essentially create abundance for myself. What if that were to become your dominant thought? And that's the same type of thinking then you can take another aspect of your life. What if having a conversation with somebody, you know, it doesn't matter, especially political right now, frankly. Mm -hmm. What if that conversation isn't about getting them to think like you, isn't about correcting their thinking, however you perceive it needs to be corrected. What if it's just about listening and having compassion for what they're saying? What if you can get out of judgment and just start listening to what people have to say? And instead of uh, letting your ego take over and trying to convince them that what they're thinking and saying is wrong. There's freedom in that. There's a certain sanctity in that. There's a certain graciousness in that. There's, there's, you know. Well, you're it, setting the bar. You're setting the example. And you're having them, you know, look to you for leadership instead of being combative. Is your first interaction with somebody, is it instantly go to judging? Well, guess what? It is for everyone. That is your first reaction. Your first reaction is a subconscious. Are they like me? Are they part of my tribe? Are they not part of my tribe? And I've never in my entire, you know, 51 years in this plant have ever intent, have experienced such an intense filtration process yeah. amongst people. And, and so that is something naturally that happens to all of us. Everyone's going to go through that. Do they, you know, you're looking for familiarity. You're looking because that's where you feel uh, comfort and security. It's, it goes back to our tribal nature, I suppose. So what if in, instead, you, you know that's going to happen. You know you're going to have that first reaction. But here's the option. Don't react to it. So you might see somebody that's nobody like you, that's nothing like you rather. Mm -hmm. it, it clearly, don't, they don't think like you. They don't act like you. But opposed to uh, in your mind allowing your, uh, your first thought's going to be that person is not like me. Don't let your second thought become I don't want to help that person. Don't let your second thought become I'm not like that person so I want to avoid that person. Become your second thought being I wonder, you know, just I wonder if I can have an open mind. I'm going to have an open mind. I'm going to say something nice for them. I'm going to do something nice for them. I'm not going to worry about being judged myself. I'm not going to worry about my feelings being hurt. I'm not going to worry about being wrong or being right. I just want to basically feel connected to that person because guess what? The essence of all of us is that uh, is that connection. That's what we all want. We want to feel like we're all part of, we are part of the same world. We are, I mean, what was it? The, the Sequoias, right? Is it mm -hmm. the Sequoias? Mm -hmm. They right, all share which, the same root structure. Yeah, which is really interesting. Yeah. I, I was wondering why, you know, these are the tallest, these are literally the tallest trees in the world. We saw them last week. And how is it that they can be growing like a foot away from each other? You'll see a stand of like four or five redwoods that are all just ginormous trees. So I looked it up and that's because they all actually have, the same root system. So there's a lesson in that, isn't there, that we can peacefully coexist? There's several. There's, mm -hmm. We can peacefully coexist. We mm -hmm. all s share the same root structure, mm -hmm. but also the sequoias grow that uh, close to each other so mm -hmm. they can uh, prevent other things from growing That's and right. taking their nourishment. Yes, right? they're That's protecting it. each other. And they all grow taller, and mm -hmm. they're all basically trying to give each other, share the same energy so mm -hmm. they can all grow taller mm -hmm. because as they grow taller, they're all going to get the same you know, benefit of the light and even the, and the water, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then through the root system, they all share it with each other. Yes. Yeah, are the exact you have to same get along way. if you're going to do that right we're grand sequoias <laughs> and if you want to be a tree by yourself in the middle of a desert good you're luck never with that right good luck with that exactly yes so bringing this full circle we've been uh bringing you a, a series called the powerful practices of top producing professionals and i'm, I'm going to actually do these points slightly out of order because of what we've just been talking about one of the points of successful top producers, not just in real estate, but in life, is that they say yes more than they say no, even if they're a little bit out of their wheelhouse. They follow the, it's my, sir, it, it's my pleasure to be of service to you attitude, or it's my pleasure to help you with that, even when they know the next step might require them to ask for help or to learn something new. The top pro producing professional doesn't live in fear of the unknown. They learn to make it known. Right. So this can be something as simple as you walk into your next listing presentation and somebody's got a collection of books that's maybe not in your wheelhouse or maybe rubs you the wrong way. Have curiosity instead of judgment. Don't make it about that. Make it about being of service to others. So top producers say yes 
more than they say no. Back to you. That's your point? Well, that's point number four. Okay. Okay. So, and speaking of, you know, also bringing it all. That is uh, a hard point for a lot of people, though, truthfully. Well, it is. And Especially I, and as you get older. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I see it. The worst part is, you know, and I should just stop going to these realtor posting sites. They'll say, like, could you ever take a listing of somebody of a political opposition to you? Or what if you saw this? And how do you react to that? And, and you know, it's just so judgy. And I And whenever I read that, I'm like, it's so not about that. It's it's about being of service. It's about solving their real estate needs. Period. So that's it. How do we get all tangled up in this other crap? But let's circle around that. Uh, so you and I have received um, a fair amount of criticism because people are wanting us to um, share publicly on our podcast because this is a you know pretty damn big podcast. Yep. It goes internationally. It's the number one listened to daily real estate podcast. Mm-hmm. You know, but they're wanting us to essentially vocalize their perspectives on the politics that are currently in the current zeitgeist. Right. And we now we won't do that. And the reason we won't do it isn't because we don't have compassion and appreciation from the political perspectives that some of you guys want us to carry the flag for, but it's because we want to be of service to as many people as possible, not just the other people that share those political views. And that's it. So where does that come from? It comes from our truest desires to be of service to as many people as we possibly can, regardless of what they actually think or what they feel. There are plenty of things out there that um, are, you know, popular in society right now that Julie and I do not agree with from a personal perspective, but it doesn't matter. That's not our job. Our mission, our simple myopic mission is essentially for those of you who care to listen, be challenged and say yes to what Julie and I are saying, opposed to saying no, because you want to say tribed up and keep your world really small, Mm -hmm. right? That's the essence of what we're talking about here. Um, But our mission is to be a service to you guys. Our mission is to make it so that you guys are sharing in the same spirit of being service to other people, because on the other side of that is where you're going to find the highest, truest purpose. uh, And and, and you're going to find the most happiness. You're going to find the most success. You're going to find the most wealth. On the other side, basically living the life of being of service to other people. Well, it's For so you, much more peaceful and less stressful. It is. And you don't then have to take a side. And it's fascinating to me because no, like no other time in uh, my adult life have I uh, have I ever experienced so many people wanting you and I. Of course, we've never really been this, I don't know, famous or micro famous, I suppose, where we've experienced this many people who are trying to pressure us to take a particular political stance. And we've had some people vocally who have said mm-hmm. things about, you know, you guys aren't taking the stance. You aren't standing up for this. You aren't standing up for that. You must not believe in it. No, you're wrong. We may do believe in it, but we're not going to vocalize it because we don't want to alienate the people who don't believe in it. It's not productive. It's not productive. What's the point of it? Totally. Yeah. It's like, I'll, t- I'll say one that's been, we, you know, uh, we talked about the vaccination thing, the, mm-hmm. the COVID thing right now. Yeah. And all the sort of misinterpret misinterpretation of the what's going on mm-hmm. and uh, different ways, different states. We, you and I don't need. We didn't even talk. We weren't even political. We just talked a little bit about it. We were factual. And we really, uh, well, me basically pissed some people off because we were not saying we weren't saying things that were incorrect. We just weren't saying things that they wanted us or wanted to hear. Right. And they got mad about it. And yeah. and so here, let me just clear the air about that because this should mm-hmm. be self evident to everyone at this point. Because Julie and I talk about the miracle of the vaccine. You absolutely should get freaking vaccinated. You should have done that a long damn time ago. That's not political. Did you get a flu shot? You should have gotten that too, by the way. Did you get shots when you were a little kid so you wouldn't get mumps and, you know, all the other nasty chicken Chicken pox pox, and all the other crap? Yes, you did. I mean, your your life, basically your healthy and your your longevity of your life has a lot to do with these modern miracles of vaccinations. My um, Aunt Ruth uh, had uh, polio. Mm Mm-hmm. And, my uh, grandma had it too. Yeah, and she yeah. had my aunt Ruth had a I mean I don't know what the b- medical term for it is, but she had basically a, a you know her like her spine right thing. she had a humpback thing going on her entire life, mm-hmm. and I remember seeing her my entire life and she'd always had this lean and she wasn't a very tall lady but because she had polio she wasn't now you know she was brilliant and amazing and fun and all that good stuff, um, but she was uh, somebody who I'll always remember because that was a for example of what happens. When you grow up without having vaccines. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, again, I, that's the extent of it. We don't need to talk about it any more than that. But just to be super clear, get a damn vaccine. It just makes sense. 
And if you're weird about it, you need to actually know the how it actually works. Now, so here's the thing. Yeah. Anti-vaxxers were pissing them off right now. I know. Okay, so if you if the anti But we still want them to live too. Yeah, we want exactly. We want you guys <laughs> okay, to live that's, too. That's my point. But do that, but do your home, but yeah. do your homework. Julie Julie and I did our homework before we got the vaccine. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of research. We did we went far beyond just wherever the headlines were, that's for damn sure. What Julie did is she started asking different doctors. Yep. She asked local doctors, we knew some doctors. We wanted to know what they were doing. Because they're more educated in that stuff than I am. Right. Than we're, you are. We're just morons basically. And so we don't know anything about any of that stuff. And Julie had several of them that spent a lot of time with her because, you know, we were skeptical, right? Who wouldn't be? There was never a vaccine that was created uh, to uh, in that short period of time. And this is a different type of vaccine, too. Right. And let's, again, I don't want to get into yeah. vaccine. But, but the point is that we didn't like, we didn't again. come pre-programmed with knowledge about it. No. This was a whole brand new thing. And we sure as hell didn't just go to one particular news source or news yeah. sources that were essentially saying the same thing over and over again and listen to what they said. Right. Um, we did our own homework and that's ultimately what you as a, like, I remember specifically, I remember when, um, you know, you were and I, uh, were in college, right. And we're in high school. One of the point of, uh, being in college, for example, was teaching you how to think critically mm -hmm. and essentially being able to, you know, slice and dice by both sides of a conversation. And I remember yeah. that we did, we were at the trailing years of that, that being our collegiate, uh, you know, experience. And it changed after that, I think in a lot of uh, colleges, but the reality of it was, is that was something that all of us, most people should have an, eight, an innate curiosity to challenge, challenging themselves on their perspectives. Mm -hmm. And this really is a, rel a relevant real estate point too, mm -hmm. because a lot of you will convince yourselves that you're not, um, you know, you think that you're only supposed to be doing real estate a certain way. Here's the perspective that comes with experience, and I'm hoping to pass this along to all of you, is that that particular way will betray you sooner than later especially if it's a passive source of lead generation. The lead generation thing is the secret sauce to longevity in real estate. But if your lead generation, and I talk about this, Julie and I talk about this constantly because it's really important. If it's all about bought business, you're going to end up uh, essentially hitting a point where you can't buy the business anymore. It becomes what's called oversaturated. And there are lots and lots of examples. But if you've never been in business before, if you've never been in the real estate business before, you don't have that perspective. Julie and I, you know, we've been in the real estate industry. We bought our first house when we were uh, 22 and 23. Mm -hmm. So we've been in the business for more than 25 years. And we've seen all the trends come and they go and then they come back again and then they go again. And a lot of them, a lot of these trends follow basically the economy. So, for example, right now, you know, we're having this booming seller's market. And so you see all of these companies that are coming out because a lot of agents are flush with cash flow. What was it? 60 billion or something like that mm -hmm. in commissions. And all these companies get into the business because they're trying to sell you guys things that are passive that and they're going to try to convince you that the, you need them for your business. Now, as soon as there's any kind of, you know, slow down or the market starts to pivot towards buyers or, you know, whatever, then you see all those companies go out of business. And then uh, the next cycle starts and you're seeing all those same businesses come back into play. Well, if it was a really good idea, wouldn't they have been able to weather the storm no matter what direction the market went? 99% of the things that you guys are being sold are only going to work when you have uh, essentially a when they're when you can't when you don't hold them accountable to working right so if you start to on this branding exercise for example there's no end to the branding and there's no way to hold it accountable that's look you can you will create a brand over time as you become more successful and help people it's called your reputation that happens organically and naturally but what you guys a lot of you especially those of you who are newer in the business are being sold to believe is that your brand is something that you have to buy and manufacture your brand is something that you have to basically spend billions and billions of dollars. And after you've spent enough money on your brand, then magically people flock to your door. Have you checked that like Julie and I did when we were considering, when we were looking into the vaccine for COVID, have you actually balanced that out on both sides or did you just believe what the crowd told you? Well, and Tim, I always refer them back to, uh, I think it was either one or two podcasts that we did about checking yourself is okay. So remember, what is it that you believe? Okay. Why do you believe that? Is it true? Is it absolutely true? Who are you because you believe it's true? And how would you think differently if you found out it wasn't true? You've got to check your thinking on virtually everything more than ever today. Yeah, you do. I mean, and it's dangerous not to. You can, you can, I mean, you could go a decade believing something that's just not right. And Factually again, not right. And not again, just, and for those of you who do feel like your world is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, 
um, it, it's because you're choosing to have it get smaller and smaller and smaller. And it, it's happening with your thinking. You've, and but that's it, curable, though. It is curable. It completely is. And the first thing we always suggest this is go media free. Do a little purge. Give yourself a break. Give your, yeah. you know, give your subconscious mind an opportunity to sort of stop, slow down, and appreciate. And that's one of the blessings of travel. Frankly, that's just one of the blessings of reading, or one of the blessings of uh, maybe even listening to some podcasts. Right? Is that you're given the opportunity to be present, and presence is where you're going to have clarity. Presence is where. When was the last time, and, and again, this is something that as you get older, it's hard to create this, right? But when was the last time you had a truly unique experience where you see something you've never seen before, where you smell something you've never smelled before, taste something you've never tasted before? It, it's hard, especially if you keep yourself in your 25 mile, mile radius, your whole world, because that's where you feel safe. That sense of safety serves a purpose, but it also diminishes your ability or it diminishes your, your experience. It diminishes your ability to be of service to other people because you just do things to reinforce because all those other same people in that same 25 mile um, radius are doing the same thing to reinforce that essentially that belief structure. And, if and we're talking about basically habits of, you know, very successful people. I, and you guys already know this. I know you do. One of the key elements to anybody that's going to be successful financially or otherwise is their willingness to say yes, to be mm -hmm. exposed to new ideas and new experiences and be omnipresent, uh, always be monitoring their tendency to want to uh, essentially make the world smaller and smaller for because their ego is trying to make them feel fear. Everybody has that innate uh, need, and this is especially true as you get older, to make your world smaller and smaller out of fear. And that fear is something you need to recognize. Why is it that I have this belief about San Francisco? It's because I've been told San Francisco is a certain way, that the people are a certain way. Well, I'm here to tell you these people are amazing. They're, um, you know, they're beautiful, honestly. Yeah, this experience we're having friendly. in this city is very, very friendly. Positive. And um, and some of the, I have to say, in uh, most um, overt. I'll, I'll I'll say this. I'll say that mm -hmm. overtly friendly. Mm -hmm. I'll, my observation: mm -hmm. people in some of the uh, states we were at before had a tendency to be more introverted than they are here. Mm -hmm. And pe agree with people that. people here are more willing. Without, um, they're more willing. They're used to diversity. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, that's a good way. So, to put so they it. so they sort of trained themselves to look past the cover and have a conversation with yeah. you regardless of how you present mm -hmm. yourself. Whereas when we were, did I express that well? Yes. Whereas when we were in, say, for example, Wyoming or other places, it didn't feel the same way. It didn't feel, it felt welcoming and it felt nice and it felt, we loved it, but it didn't feel the same. People here, for example, are sort of innately, I think, um, you know, uh, driven to have more connected, more more connectivity with people on a higher level quicker than they are in yeah. other parts of the world. But they I don't have closed minds, basically. Yeah. Is the sense I I'm would getting. agree with that. Yeah. I would agree with that. So, you know, but, you know, we, we do help our coaching clients with this a lot. Here's a typical premier coaching session will be, because we do those every day, an agent uh, who's in our coaching will come to that semi-private call and they'll say, okay, here's the deal. I need help with this. I did what you said, and I said, yes, it'd be my pleasure to help you with that. <laughs> right. But OMG, I'm going on a high-end listing appointment in a neighborhood I've never been in. I've never sold a house more than 350000 This is a million three fifty. What do I do? What do I do? So that's typically how we help them. Or they might say, you know, I said yes because you said say yes to everything, but I've never done a 1031 exchange. How do I find out more about that well, so that I can come off as the person who's actually going to do the job. Obviously, you want to basically attach yourself to coaching and training so you don't have to figure it out on the job. Because if you figure it out on the job, then you're going to be in a situation where you're going to fumble it and, the, and you're going to end up basically on the wrong side of the transaction. And that's then you really, won't feel like saying yes again because right. you feel like you got burnt by that. And some of you, that's going to be all the excuse you need to do to start hiding under your closet for the rest of your life. Yeah. So the best thing for you to do, and guys, this is self-serving, but who cares, right? Is join our Is right, join our coaching program. You like the podcast. I know you do because there's thousands, tens now. of thousands of you listen to it every day. Um, and uh, we, you like our book, Harris Rules. It's one of the you know biggest, best-selling um, real estate books, a book specifically written for real estate agents and brokers on how to build their business for sale at every major bookseller. Um, Barnes & Noble, we've seen it in Barnes & Noble. nothing more fun than seeing your book for sale on a book rack in Barnes & Noble. I have to say that's still cool. I haven't gotten used to it yet. Um, and Amazon, uh, it's called Harris Rules. So what we're saying is resonating with many of you. It's resonating with tens of thousands of you, perhaps millions of you. Are you actually internalizing the message to the point where you're now thinking to yourself, I need to proactively 
just start saying yes, but I need to say yes to myself first. I need to say yes to my desire, my, the desires I have to, to have a richer, fuller life, richer in the literal sense and the richer in whatever you know contextuality you would like it to be. But am I saying yes to opportunities that are all around me or am I making my world smaller and smaller and smaller because I'm uh, essentially the inputs that I'm having are making me feel more and more fearful? And unfortunately, that's what's happening in our country right now, at least for some of you, but not for all of you. But I do sense that people, even the people that are on the both extremes of this sort of political aisle, they're starting to have they're getting they're getting fed up. They're having enough. They're, they're, you know what? I get it. You know, I get this and the other thing and I get why this group of people think this way and this group of people think the other thing other way. But at the end of the day, all of our roots are interconnected. All of us are the same and, and all of us want the same thing. So let's set aside all this goofiness and let's get back to really what the highest and truest purpose of all of us is, which is being of service to other people. Now for that, be myopic. Your highest and truest purpose on this planet as a real estate pract practitioner now that you have a real estate license, you've had a real estate license for a while, many of you, is to become the best version of yourself as a real estate agent. There's no, and, and whatever you're lacking right now from your sales skills perspective, from your listing presentation, your pre-listing pack, you can make all those things up. You can learn all those things so you can feel, start feeling comfortable uh, to say yes with more people. And we would encourage you and we would appreciate the honor of being your coaches. Text the word SUCCESS to 47372. Text the word SUCCESS to 47372. You could also just hop over to timandjulieharris.com and click on Coaching and join Premier Coaching. It is the perfect way to become one of our coaching clients. Um, if you want to just shortcut that, just text the word SUCCESS to 47372, and we'll text you back a link to that very same page that you would have found had you gone to the website directly. In the meantime, guys, and again, I mean this from the absolute essence of Julie and I and all of our coaches, all the people that work for us, our coaching organization, uh, we sincerely, wholeheartedly, fundamentally appreciate you being in our lives every single day and you allowing us to be in your life. It's something that's meaningful for us because it puts us in alignment with what our highest and truest purpose on this planet is, which is being of service to all of you. Hopefully you feel that way. And if you don't, start removing things from your life that are causing you to feel embattled, that are causing you to feel bitter. Start removing those things and do it intentionally, do it purposefully until you start appreciating, till you start feeling in tune, till you start feeling present again. And then you're going to start getting back in alignment with your what your highest and truest purpose on this planet is. Anything else? Yes, get to work on this. Don't just keep doing what you've been doing, getting what you're getting. If you're not satisfied, you've got to change what you're doing. You know, we, we talked a couple days ago about just start with something simple. Send five, you know, uh, feelings of gratitude, cards, compliments. Start reprogramming how you're looking at things. If you tend towards the negative, start reprogramming towards the positive. Little steps. We asked you guys this the other day, and a lot of you did it, and I appreciate it. Uh, please do, if you're on iTunes or Stitcher, please do give Julie and I a five-star review. It really does help. Uh, basically, that it, what happens is iTunes in particular, that's the mothership for all podcasts. And when you give somebody a five-star review, especially if you uh, take the time and just put a few words of praise in, that actually then encourages the algorithm in iTunes then to uh, expose that podcast to more people that also might appreciate it. So more real estate people around the world. And I know we have listeners all over the world now. It's incredible. It's over 70 different countries. And again, this is mostly from iTunes helping us spread the word. So please, guys, do us a favor. Um, do show gratitude uh, towards the podcast and go to iTunes and please give us a five-star review. Unfortunately, a four-star review doesn't do much good. So a five-star review, we'd certainly appreciate it. In the meantime, you guys have a fantastic day and we'll talk with you on the show tomorrow. This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris, Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, visit our website at timandjulieharris.com. Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.